Speaking Basketball Podcast. My name is Ben. Welcome back to another episode. We are done with game one. I don't know why I said it like that, like the series was <laughs> over or something. We we made it through uh, game one in the West, game one in the East. They did not disappoint. We've got we've got we've got to figure out what we're going to talk about today because we've got some bigger fish to fry. But I do think we have to uh, we have to stop and sort of uh, go back and just discuss the glory of these two opening games. I'm going to let you decide where you want to start because last night we had the Jimmy Butler experience back in uh, Boston. Who could have seen, who could have seen that coming? No one could have foretold a Jimmy Butler game one. And then, and then we had the, uh, I mean, maybe the best three quarters of offense I've ever seen a basketball player play from, from uh, Nikola Jokic. And, and then the Lakers were like, we're going to, we have Rui Hachimura. We're going to try him. And they uh, made like seven threes and almost won the game. It's, it's glorious, Cody. How are you doing? What do you want to talk about? Well, you come out and you say we have some fish to fry or something like that. And we, we don't know what we're going to talk about. Like you said, like this is a fish concert. Like we're coming out here, no sheet music prepared. It's time to just jam out for a few minutes and see what happens. Fish the um, band, P- Phil Lesh, P H I S H. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. We're like Red Rocks type of concert. We're going live today. Uh, let's start with that Heat Celtics game, Ben. I want to I want to ask a question that I've seen. There's like two camps right now. There's the like Jimmy Butler is a complete and total genius. Eric Spoelstra might be the greatest coach in any sport that's ever existed. But then there's some people that are like, but also the Heat aren't missing from three, and that explains like everything that's going on. What's going on like with this game with their success? Is it like is there something going on that's magical and mystical between Jimmy Butler and Eric Spolstra, or is it just completely explained by their uh, three point explosion? Cody, I'm going to read you a tweet from <laughs> Bucks Film Room on Twitter. Okay, uh, it's from Bucks Film Room. They do a lot of breakdowns for the Bucks. You may be familiar with them. The five stages of losing to the Miami Heat in the playoffs. Stage one is denial. They can't keep playing like this. Stage two is disbelief. How do they keep playing like this? How do they keep making all these shots? Stage three is anger, right? We get, we get to the, art, uh, the anger stage of the five stages of losing to the Heat. There is no way that the Heat should be playing like this. I, I do not accept it. Stage four, of course, is bargaining. The Heat must have made some kind of basketball deal with the devil. I don't understand what's going on. And stage stage five is just depression. Damn. When you realize the Heat have defeated you. Uh, Does that answer your question or do we need to do more analysis? I'm friends with a couple of Celtics fans out there. And yesterday after the game, I was just like, how are we feeling? And one of them comes back immediately. And he's like, oh, it's just game one. We've got, I feel pretty good. We've got this. And I'm like... That's exactly what I said. That's that's exactly what I said. So I, I think I've went through every single one of those stages, and I'm still somewhere in the processing stage, Ben. In all seriousness, uh, I don't know what it was, but at some point, I, I, I texted you. I texted the group in the first quarter. I was like, I've, I see the light. I'm converted. It all makes sense. First of all, in the first quarter, I just thought Miami was going to win the game last night. Secondly, I was like, it all fits together. I see how it all fits together. I see the Butler centricity of it. I see the, the way Spolstra uses uh, the three. These guys need a name. They're like the three amigos or something. They need a name. Gabe Vincent, Max Struess, and um, maybe Caleb it's Martin? just... And Caleb, thank you, thank you. And Caleb Martin, those three players need a name. They all go into playoff games and make massive shots. They play incredibly fundamentally sound within the team concept. They're all really good defensively. Caleb Caleb Martin got a rebound. I think it was in game one against the Celtics. It was one of the greatest offensive rebounds I've ever seen. It was a long rebound where the ball went to the left side of the court. So if you're watching on TV, the opposite side of the court. And Caleb Martin was in the near side corner on the right side of the court. And he just sprinted across the floor, reading the shot to go get the rebound and keep it alive. I want to say in the fourth quarter at some point of last night's game, but... Honestly, I've been looking at, at Heat and Jimmy Butler film this morning, so it could have been the fourth quarter in one of the Bucks games because that's the other thing about the Heat and Spolstra and those three amigos and Butler. Every game is the same. 
Every game is exciting. You, you, it's like, oh, the Heat are down 11 in the second half, and uh, Kevin Love's made a couple threes, and Kyle Lowry. That's a nice story. Kevin Love and Kyle Lowry are are they're they're playing well, even though they're old timers and they're long in the tooth. And then they come out, and and both of these guys. I don't think Love has had the same statistical blip, but both of these guys have been better statistically in the 12 or 14 playoff games they've played or whatever. And it's just like, yeah, at the end of the day, when you have wide open threes that other people are creating, whether it's defense, transition, Jimmy Butler, do do I trust Kevin Love and Kyle Lowry to make wide open threes in playoff games? I do, and that's the thing, and they're making them. So I'm trying as I'm trying to give you the longest possible answer to your question. But I, I think the truth is no team is going to shoot 45% from downtown over a sustained period. But as we said last episode, and maybe that's why my mind was going to a different place last night when I was watching them, they, they have shooters that are getting minutes maybe that didn't get the same minutes they got in the regular season. And they have guys that as the pressure cooker amplifies in the postseason, those three amigos, they're all they're not great shooters, just like Jimmy Butler isn't a great shooter. But you kind of can rely on them in a series to like punch above their weight a little bit. And that's before we get to the Eric Spolstra uh, defense coaching. I mean, just looking at the film this morning, there there is no lens, I think, that you can watch the Miami Heat through where you don't come out going, oh, OK, Eric Spolstra is a genius. That's a pretty big advantage in every series. <laughs> and. I, I guess what are the things that you're seeing in the film room? Is it is it because I mean that's the thing that I think is really hard to like separate from each other. Is we see these guys. You bring up Gabe Vincent, Caleb Martin, Bam Adebayo, even Kevin Love buying into the whole defensive process. Like these guys are all on a string. So on one hand, you want to point to them and be like, "Hey, great on you for buying into all this, Caleb Martin. Good on you to like sprint over and get this." But also, I don't know how to separate that from that's like you have maybe the best coach in the NBA on the sideline putting this all together so it's this interesting thing where it's like you wouldn't imagine that these guys would fit in super well with like a high level defensive concept in the playoffs but also they are so like am I giving credit to to them am I giving it to Spolstra I don't know I'm just impressed all across the board with them it reminds me a little of uh Bill Belichick and the Patriots in football who I watched for so many years when I was younger where it's like everyone was really well coached and if you didn't have the discipline you just wouldn't play so you end up with undrafted free agents playing, but those are the guys who can seemingly execute the vision. And so, yeah, you pointed to defense, but I'll give you another one, Cody. If you, you want to see what like jumps out when you're watching film, there's a play where Jimmy Butler has the ball out near half court. The clock's running down, says, I want a little pick and roll action, drives left, makes a jumper in the mid-range. And you might think like, okay, um, that's cool. Jimmy Butler has a mid-range jumper. We all know that. But then you rewind it. And what happens is Butler is driving left toward the opposite block and someone like goes to help a little because that's what you do. You're, you're guarding a guy in the dunker spot. Caleb Martin's in the dunker spot and you step up to help naturally. What does Caleb Martin do as Jimmy Butler comes off the screen with the, with the ball out near the top of the key? All of a sudden he sprints out to the other corner. And so that defender who normally is like, oh, I'm going to step up and help, he just has to chase Caleb Martin out of the play, and that creates the space. And I kind of wonder at this point if every Miami player has been like ingrained, because he's not the only player I've seen do that. Like, do they all have this deep understanding of how to create little advantages, where to position themselves, how to overload, how to, how to, how to sort of screen and then create space and vacate? <sighs> yeah, they're... Uh, they're 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 good. It's good so stuff. You say this, okay? But I'm I'm gonna admit something to you because I really do like watching the Heat. I think they're very good. Obviously, they they started off the playoffs and they're keeping keeping up their hot streak so far. But when I was watching the game yesterday, I was pretty confident the Celtics were gonna win for like the first three quarters, right? Oh for wow, like the first okay. three quarters. Because I think a a big thing that happened is right away I thought the Heat were playing some good defense, but then like the Celtics started getting some paint touches, right? The Heat switched over to their zone, which I thought was doing an okay job. But then Jason Tatum was getting some, you know, during a zone, calls up a ball screen, they run their man-to-man offense, he gets straight downhill for a layup. Marcus Smart, Marcus Magic Johnson Smart yesterday, (laughs) throwing some of the best dimes he's thrown 
all season. I mean, this is the kind of Marcus Smart that we talked about a lot last year where he's just, man, some of those passes were just incredible. And I thought in the second quarter that if it wasn't for Kyle Lowry just like pulling up from three with reckless abandon, snaking the pick and roll for a step back mid, like, I don't know. If it wasn't for that, I'm like, I feel like this Heat team should be down by like 18. Then the third quarter, all of a sudden Kevin Love's out there, hits a couple of threes, I think like three threes or something like that. It's like a two-point game. And then it's after that the Heat take the lead. And once they had like an eight or ten-point lead, that's when I started being like, all right, this Heat team is too disciplined. They're not going to give it up. But if it wasn't for like those moments, I thought the Celtics were playing reasonably well for a good chunk of time. And then it was the hot shooting that brought the Heat back into it. The the weirdest thing is that Jimmy Butler is both playing incredibly, and when you look closer on film, it gets more impressive. He's one of those players, uh, our, our friend Andre Snellings uh, from ESPN, he has talked about Kevin Garnett as like a player where you zoom in, you have to zoom in to appreciate more of the genius. And Butler has that when you like look closer, you're like, oh, he's, there's an incredible amount of stuff he's doing that's brilliant on both ends of the court, and yet... The Heat have been better when he's been on the bench in these playoffs. Maybe some of it is this shooting you're talking about, shooting kind of uh, just streaky, running good shooting. But even last night, when he plays this great game, the whole game, uh, the Heat won by seven, and he was plus five uh, on the court, which means they were plus two when he went to the bench. And if you look at the rest of the starters, it's like the lineups that really did a ton of damage there and some of those big runs – Bam Adebayo was plus 18. Max Struess was plus 15. Uh, by, by the way, please recommend a nickname for these three amigos, these these South Beach role players. They just they they, they need to be grouped together for all eternity. I think it's um it's 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 really something at this point. This is one of those things, right? I feel like I can't contribute anything. You need to have like a knowledge of Floridian culture to maybe come up with something. I don't want to say something. People are like, no, Cody, like you clearly don't understand Florida from your Midwest ivory tower. What do we have? We don't have ivory towers here. What do we have? Yeah. Our, my Midwest treehouse. You have a wood log. House. You have a yeah. 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 <laughs> The Midwest treehouse. I can't You're in a it. cabin. I, can't offer. I like are you, that. Are you podcasting from a treehouse right now? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking out over the vast woodlands here, just peeking out to see who's within the next 10 miles. No, no one's getting near me when I'm podcasting, though. I'm in complete isolation. I don't remember what we were talking about. Can you can you get us on track? I we're talking about the heat. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, Ben, hot shooting. Oh, the shooting. Yes, the yeah. shooting. Yeah. yeah. Well, they did shoot. They did shoot fifty two percent from downtown <laughs> last night. And I, I no, I don't think they're going to shoot fifty percent from downtown again. Uh, here, here's where I am on this series, and I don't know if it came through when we were uh, sort of looking ahead to the series, uh, both conference finals last time. I think the Celtics are good enough to win this series. In my head, it was like, do they win uh, four out of five times, nine out of 10 times? Like, they'll lose it a couple times, but I feel like they're, I feel like they have a healthy advantage over the Heat. At the same time, I'm not surprised at all with what I saw in game one, and I do think Boston's going to have to work for it to create a, a consistent advantage because you get one game like that, the Heat capitalize, they take one game. They have to do that three more times. Can they have another hot shooting night easily? Okay, that's that's two. Two down, two to go. Can they have two hot shooting nights? Yeah, I think so. I think they can have two hot shooting nights. Can they have one of those games like last year? I want to say game four off the top of my head. Uh, Maybe it was game five. I I think the Heat had home court in the series last year, right? Yeah, so, so maybe it was game. It was some game. They had like 19 steals. Do you remember this game? (laughs) <laughs> it just, sounds very accurate. Yeah, yeah. They they turned over Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum like six or seven times each. Can they get a game like that where they like have a ton of turnovers that spark a bunch of offense and they don't need to shoot 45% from downtown? I think they can, and that's number four. And so can they win the series? I do think they can. Is there kind of a blueprint to win the series? They're just so consistently good at everything. So when the shot is dropping like it was last night, winning and capitalizing on those games that's the pathway. And, uh, and I do think to create a better advantage, the Celtics, just like they did last year, are going to have to move some pieces around, think about the lineups. They went single big last year for a lot of the series where you didn't have Rob, Hor- uh, Rob Williams and Al Horford together. They got more offense and space. They're going to have to do stuff like that. It's, it's not going to be easy. Miami does not make anything easy. No, it's not going to be easy. But I also, part of me thinks if they just kept the process from yesterday's game, 
that they should basically be okay. And like you said, I think the other factor that goes in here is what we've seen from the Celtics throughout this entire playoffs is they have the capacity to easily just drop a game or two from being disengaged, not running the plan, something like that. So I do think that there is a, a, I don't know, an avenue or two right now for the Heat, but I don't know if I'm just like drunk on the the excitement that is watching Miami topple another game one. I do think the Celtics get more flack than any other team I can remember for just like not sweeping every opponent they ever play. <laughs> I mean, they shot 35% from three last night. So some people, you know, is that good? Is that bad? Is that a really off night? They had uh, 15 turnovers. Is that too many? I, I mean, what ends up happening is if the turnovers are high, if Tatum's shooting is low, if someone has a, a, a play in transition where they get up, give up an easy layup, the narrative seems to be, well, they just weren't engaged for the, you know, they just didn't try in this game. What's wrong with them? They're, they're so mercurial. They're so inconsistent, these Boston Celtics. I don't think it's quite that extreme. I think, I think you have a good game. You put together a good game plan. Uh, they can be beaten. Now, if, if they bring their A plus game every night, is that easy to beat? No, of course not. They went to the NBA finals last year after storming the league in the second half of the season. And statistically, they were the strongest team in the regular season by far this year. They have two all NBA players. They have probably the most balanced sort of complete deep roster, at least on paper, where you get out to like the seventh man and you're like, that guy's really good. And you can plug him in a lot of lineups. They have all these players who are two way players who don't really give up much defensively. So I understand the appeal, but I, I do, I do sometimes think they get a little too much flack for like, well, the reason the Celtics lost is they were partying the night before they didn't, they did, they didn't care. It's just, come on. I, I think it's less like the partying thing and less and more like they don't have that dog in them. Yeah, like that, of course. That, that's of course. the thing that gets brought up about. So yeah. has has anything changed in your mind about this series? Do you have any big proclamations before we, we talk about the other coast? Uh, nothing has changed that much. I think the only thing for cha- that has changed for me with the, with the Heat going out and getting game one is I do think their odds of winning in my head go up. You know, they, mm-hmm. they took that first step. Um, they, they stole serve by winning on the road, although I don't know how much home court matters in this series. And they, they need three. The Celtics need four. And I think there's a pathway for Miami to do it. So I am inching that bar in my head. If I were placing a bet somewhere, I'm like, OK, I think the odd the win probability is getting a little higher for Miami. But I didn't really see anything too much in game one that uh, swayed me in either direction. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of how exactly how I feel. Everything that I saw is like not that I expected the series to go for it, but seeing a game like that happen, I'm like, yeah, I was expecting that to happen at some point in the series. The uh, the Western Conference uh, that was a that was a doozy of an opening game. My goodness, both teams with offensive ratings over 130 in this opening game. Um, I mean, if we have a series like this, I don't even know if I'm going to be able... I, I like. I needed a nap after the game. I don't know about you, but it was just draining and exhausting and exhilarating. And the, the first three quarters from Jokic just, I mean, as close to offensive perfection as I can remember seeing anybody play for, a, for nearly a full game. It was silly. I mean, the fadeaway three he hit against the clock on the sideline was silly because on one hand, I don't know if anyone caught this, he didn't shoot it with his normal shooting motion. motion. He shot put at it. So that's like the degree of touch and hand-eye coordination that he has. And at the exact same time, I was watching it and I was like, that's probably going in. <laughs> and it went in. Yeah. yeah. I think Anthony Davis was thinking that during that as well. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, f- I feel like everyone's going to be talking about this, but I do think the big takeaway from the game that I'm really interested to see is the Lakers seem to have a little bit of success with uh, with putting Rui Hachimura on Jokic. I was wrong, Ben. Aaron Gordon didn't actually end up defending Jokic. Like, for some reason, that prediction of mine was... Uh, well, Davis was on LeBron a good yeah. amount of the game. So, yeah. so that yeah. part we, of it was right. We were spot on on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But with with Rui on Jokic and having Anthony Davis kind of roam by the rim and play a paint protector, uh, the Lakers saw a little bit of success and they put in a good run at the end. What sorts of adjustments do you foresee the Nuggets taking to try and counteract that the that a defensive tactic that the Lakers were using? Well, I think the more the Nuggets see it, the better they will be at attacking it. I do think from just sort of an absolute structural standpoint having Anthony Davis closer to the basket. And maybe this is what we want to talk about today with big men and centers and the the sort of push and pull that's been taking 
place in the playoffs this season and for multiple seasons. You get a guy like that who's that big, who's that skilled at protecting the paint. You want to keep him as close to the basket as possible, and that is effectively what the Lakers are trying to do. That is what the Celtics have tried to do with Rob Williams in the regular season last year when we talked about and chronicled that change. I think we had a video. We had an enhanced podcast about it on the YouTube channel. Uh, They did it in the previous series. We saw Philadelphia do it in the regular season when they matched up with the Nuggets in Pennsylvania, where it's like, okay, let's how do how do we keep Embiid closer to the basket? And so the video I made on game one was really to me about how in the first three quarters you got to see Denver and Jokic exploit all the ways they can attack Davis when Davis is on him, because you have to come out. You have to come out away from that area. So you have, he stretches you out when he shoots. He pulls you out when he moves around and screens and cuts and all this stuff that we've talked about that he does away from the ball. And his passing stretches you out. You know, you can't just, it's like, okay, Jokic uh, has the ball at the elbow. What are you going to do? Sag off him? You can't sag off him. So if he's the one making that pass and you're guarding the passer, very hard to help. So structurally, I think it's just better for the Lakers, period, in any series to have Davis closer to the hoop. The flip side is I don't think it's a cure-all for slowing down the Nuggets. The Nuggets offense is absolutely incredible any way you slice it for just almost the entire season. And I I think in game one in the fourth quarter, for instance, Aaron Gordon was in that dunker spot. You alluded to that. The spacing isn't great. It makes Davis's help easy. Uh, I think they'll move him around. I think they'll... First of all, just putting him in the corner, which I don't think is great, but putting him in the corner at least creates a little more space and opens up a a shooter that you can target with passes. Secondly, you can bring him into the screening action. And third, you could uh, put him up in the slot on the wing, and then he can catch and shoot, catch and attack, or he can cut on that 45 cut that we've talked about so much, depending on how you set up the two-man game, the pick and roll. So the brilliance of and the beauty of the Nuggets offense and not just Jokic, but Jokic and Murray and their two man and all the shooters, Michael Porter Jr., Contavious Caldwell Pope, is they can do that stuff and it all fits in the offense. I don't really think they have to change a thing. They just have to move the pieces, involve a few different people, and it still all fits together and the machine runs. But I do think the Lakers for the rest of the series are going to be operating at a slightly higher baseline defensively because they have a guy who has been a god protecting the basket uh, closer to the hoop than chasing this monster Jokic around on the perimeter. We've got our, for Patreon subscribers at patreon.com slash thinking basketball, we have our defense, some more defense and rim protection numbers that we've added for these playoffs. And you can see Anthony Davis, he's, he's just off the charts at like 17 or 18% below expected shooting around the hoop in the playoffs and multi-year samples. And then even when he goes on, when he's on the court versus off the court, the Lakers rim numbers, just the other team, I think the other team shooting like 58% at the rim off the top of my head. He, he just looks unbelievable. So I think that that's an interesting thing going forward because I do think it uh, gives the Lakers a little bit more of an edge on that side. This, this is what always frustrated me when people talked about Giannis defensively and they're like, oh, why don't you just put Giannis on the other team's best player? And I think this last game between Jokic and Davis was a good illustration of why not. Like, can Anthony Davis go and defend another big man on the perimeter? Yes. But even though you're adding value in one place, that means right, like, in the pie chart here, the zero sum of defense, you're taking away your value away from the rim. And I think, like you just said, that was a huge part of why they had success is because you have this God-level defensive rim protector keeping near the rim. There was something else I was thinking about, Ben, in terms of the stretchiness of Jokic that I want to run it by you. This is just really interesting. Is it actually tougher to close out on a player with a really slow jump shot? Like a set shot? Because I was thinking about Jokic. Like, there's a couple times that Anthony Davis, like, comes up to Jokic when he's going to shoot off that three. And then he, like, pauses for a second. He's like, is he shooting? Is he about to go dribble? And then Jokic just kind of fires it off. And I noticed it a few times with guys like Kyle Anderson, Jonas Valanciunas. Players, like, don't know what to do. They, like, go up and they're like, 
all right, are you going to be shooting now? And then by the time they shoot, like, you've given them enough airspace. So there's this thing going on with Jokic, too, where I watch him, like, I don't know how you actually close out on him because you can never tell when he's really going to shoot it because he can flow so well from, like, the three-second release to all of a sudden he's dribbling by you for a layup. I think that's probably the um, the high release point, don't you think? Where it, it wouldn't work if you're short. If you're, like, a small guard... And you slow it down a lot as some big guys coming to close out on you. As he gets into that airspace, the the length and the reach. Uh, whoa! If you're watching on YouTube, that's really pronounced. <laughs> uh, I'm sticking my hand into the camera like I'm blocking a shot. Word but 3D. it's like you, you you see what I'm you see what I'm saying. I think that works if you're big and you have a high release because as that player gets close to you, you still you're still comfortable. You still have that airspace. When you're a smaller dude or you have a lower release point. And Anthony Davis is flying at you on the corner. We know he can block the shot from like the paint. He's like, he, he's like, I'm in the paint. I will take off from the paint and somehow block the shot. So I, I imagine that's what you're talking about there. Yeah, I think it's a combination of that and big men who close out are just naturally going to be slower at closing out than a smaller player. Like, they're not going to be able to recover quickly, but keep an eye on it. It's really interesting. The, like, battle players have that's like, how closely should I get to Jokic when he's firing this off? Because I can't really tell if he's really shooting this possession. Yeah. Um, It's interesting. The centers and the big men have been at the forefront of so much of what is happening strategically in the playoffs and and so many of the videos that we've done and sort of the conversations we've had on this show how do you get rob williams out of the paint closer to the basket what do you do with Giannis? do do you consider Giannis a center uh no he's like the the mythical four or five perfect hybrid kind of player i think i don't know i feel like i would prefer him to be at a four with a stretchier five that also rebound i don't know for sure i don't know i don't is tim duncan a center yeah. Oh, Tim Duncan's the center. Okay, so that one's easier. What about Anthony Davis? Uh, yeah, Anthony Davis is a center. Especially now that he's like bulked up, not like slimmer 2017 Davis. I think right now he's clearly a center. I mean, on one hand, does this even matter? Is this just semantics, this, this categorization? Or do you think when you say Giannis is mythical, do you think there is something about being able to play in other configurations where you're like at your best at the second biggest position on the court, the, the four, the power forward? I feel like, hmm. in terms of that, I feel like if you're in that position where you want to be the four, that means that you're like, you want to kind of be unleashed to roam around everywhere, right? Like, you can pick off passing lanes, uh, you can kind of hang out at the nail, play defense there, but when it comes to, like, big men like Brooke Lopez, you don't want him roaming. Like, he's not going to jump out and, like, pick off your passing lane for a pick six. Like, Brooke Lopez has never done that. He's never going to do that. Don't send me any clips. It's never happened. Um, (laughs) And I think that's the difference between, like, Giannis and some of these other guys. Whereas, like, I think Anthony Davis could play that role, but he just seems, like, bigger than Giannis someone's going to send me some numbers and be like they're actually the same size so again I'm just I'm just going off the top here but I think that's the thing about Giannis is you can kind of deploy him as a roamer anywhere in the half court and he's going to be as damaging there whereas somebody like Anthony Davis I think is just more protective of the rim as opposed to being able to move as fluidly uh closer to the perimeter all right I don't want to get us bogged down here but I am curious then what what position does like Jason Tatum play defensively if Giannis is a four what is Jason Tatum well I think so when I say Giannis is like the mythical four or five I'm saying that he's probably best at that four position and then can slot pretty seamlessly at the five I don't feel that same way about Jason Tatum Jason Tatum's a fine rim protector which I think is what makes him uh such a good defensive player but he's not like a Giannis level rim protector he's not like a Draymond Green level rim protector these guys that can play those positions so I think he naturally needs another big next to him to really unlock his defensive skills because I think you want to move him up closer to the nail to really unleash his defensive proclivities all right well the gambit I'm really setting up because I want to I want to talk about uh, some of these big men and the value of big men and the dynamics that we've seen in the playoffs right now. But if if Giannis is not in this conversation, then how is Bam Adebayo in this conversation? Is, would, is yeah. yeah, no, go ahead. You have thoughts on this. No, I was wondering if you were going to bring that up because I think Bam is a really interesting uh, illustrative, illustrative. I don't want to say illustrative. That sounds much better in my in my wooden... Uh, treehouse over here but I think he he's illustrative here because he's so good 
at doing the sorts of things I said. I think he's better at switching than somebody like Giannis. So I think the thing about keeping him at the five is that you almost want him to get in like these pick and roll actions. So when like a team comes up and is like, hey, I'm going to call up the center, when you have Bam out there, he nullifies that advantage, right? I don't necessarily think Giannis nullifies that much. I think Giannis is a better off-ball defensive player than Bam. I think Bam, again, when you're that good of a defensive player, you can play at the nail and whatever else. But I think Giannis is a much better nail defender than Bam, whereas Bam uh, can switch out on the perimeter, nullifies those pick and rolls, but can also keep the back line defense even though he's not a super strong rim protector comparatively to these other guys, he's still a big body down there that's going to deter some drives because of his quickness and, and athleticism. Well, maybe, boy, maybe the place to start is with Bam in Miami then because if if Bam, well, I think we agree, we've talked about this in the defensive episode, Bam is very switchable and he's very mobile and horizontal on the perimeter. He's got pretty good feet for his size and length. So... He's not the same rim protector as these other guys, but you don't really have the same game necessarily with Bam where you're like, we as an offense, we have to find a way to pull him out of the paint. And you said it with the pick and roll example. Sometimes you're even inviting trouble depending on your team and who you are. It's like, Trey Young, let's run some pick and roll. Bring up the center. Oh, it's Bam. Now I'm being guarded by Bam. I don't know if this is a good idea. That feels a little different than the cat and mouse game We've seen in some of these other series where it's like, how do we get Davis out of the paint? How do we attack or get Rob Williams, Brooke Lopez, Giannis? Um, stop me if I'm forgetting anyone, but th- there's maybe that's the place to start where if we're going to talk about how valuable big men and centers are in the playoffs and the dynamic of teams attacking them, is someone like Bam a different animal because you don't, I don't even know, do you even want to pull him I guess in theory, you still want to pull him out of the paint for spacing, just like you would for anyone, but he doesn't really get attacked, right? Yeah. And yeah, I think that's ultimately what you're saying here. And this is a really big conversation, Ben. I like this because <laughs> so, I think here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I figured out here's the differentiation between them. If you have Bam playing like the four position and you have another, another big man out there, say like, let's pair him with Brooke Lopez just for the sake of argument, like that kind of a big man. If you have Bam at the four, having another big basically – eradicates his skill, right? The fact what you when you have Bam out there is you have such a flexible defensive player, you have such a flexible defensive anchor that you can throw any kind of defense out there and it's going to be fine. This is why the Heat are so good at flowing in between their like weird amorphous matchup zone that they're able to get into where you're able to kind of bring Bam up closer up to, to the top of the key and then he can flow back super low towards the rim. And if you have another big out there, he's not the one that's dictating all of that. So I think that's sort of the secret sauce that makes him so valuable in that sense. So I I don't know. I think it's the fact that you can unlock any defensive scheme when you have Bam out there, whereas some of these other guys, you move them to the five or the four, there are some weak points that you can still have with them. I I forgot the uh, most glaring example of this in the last three, four, five seasons, six seasons, Rudy Gobert. Right, who's with Minnesota now, but I mean, think about it. They had to play Jokic in the first round and the Nuggets offense this season. Uh, the year before, they had to play the Mavs in the first round. It might be the most favorable matchup uh, a Rudy Gobert team has had for most of the the run. I guess in 2021, um, they, they didn't have these just playing the Rockets and the Golden State Warriors and things like that. It, it really amplified some of these issues because... I think regardless of what you view him at this season in terms of health and mobility and effectiveness, Gobert as a, as a drop defender uh, has been pretty good in terms of his mobility with other drop defenders. And yet when you look at the playoff stuff, it's like Rob Williams looks great. Statistically, his teams do really well when he can play out there. Brooke Lopez has had huge defensive runs. His teams look really good when he, when he's out there. Um, who else? I'm, I'm forgetting another big drop. Uh, Joel Embiid in a lot of series has, has looked really good. So, you know, I don't even know what I'm saying at this point. I'm just, I just, there, there, this is, this is a big conversation. So I think there's an interesting language game going on here, Ben, 
language game. And I, I thought of this when, you know, once in a while I'll read what someone has to say about some prospects. And I'm protecting this person's identity because, A, I forgot who wrote it, and B, I forgot what prospect they were actually talking about. But I read something about a prospect, and basically the description was like, when this guy is in the league, he's going to be one of the best rim protectors in the league, and then he's a fantastic finisher, and he can finish with both right and left hand. And I'm reading, oh, and it's also like, oh, he's also switchable. He can go out in the perimeter and do this. And I read those like four descriptions and I'm immediately like, that's like an all NBA level player right there. Like, I think we're throwing around some of these words to describe them. So when we have guys like Embiid or Gobert, for instance, when we talk about their defense, we're like, yeah, they're excellent drop defenders and they can switch. They can hedge once in a while and play in space. But when you say they can, like, what do you actually mean by they can? Like they can do it relative to other drop defenders because here's the thing when you have let's say game seven Celtics and 76ers and you have Jason Tatum taking Joel Embiid off the dribble especially in that game when Embiid seemed a little bit slower in that moment it doesn't matter what he is relative to other drop centers right all that matters is can he stay in front of Jason Tatum right there and so when you're thinking about oh he can switch out he can't really switch out in terms of like high level playoff switchable defenders like Bam at a bio. So I think that's a really interesting part of this conversation as well. It's when we talk about what a player can and can't do and at what level, it gets a little bit murky about how good they actually are at these specific skill sets. Yeah, I mean in this case I'm just thinking about the the big defensive names and this sort of game where you try to pull them out of the paint and then the other team wants to keep them in the paint we can we can table the big defensive names for a second and just go to something more basic where you go back to the Knicks series against the Heat where where the Knicks outscored the Heat when they had their best players on the court and lost the series in six you go back to that series one of my frustrations was um, we never got to really see a small ball lineup from New York where you didn't have Mitchell Robinson or Isaiah Hartenstein. And obviously we know why Tibbs wanted that shot blocking presence, wants that offensive rebounder. That's been a lot of their identity for the entire season. I still wanted to see it, but you take a guy like that. That is a more um, traditional big man who is more limited offensively in today's game. And the league is being flooded with more skill more shooting, more on-ball playmaking. So for those lower-level bigs, as you keep getting later in the postseason, Kavon Looney maybe is an interesting example. I mean, do you know off the top of your head how many minutes per game Kavon Looney played in the playoffs last year? Last year? Yeah, last year. We know We know this season, we could do this season too. We know this season in the Sacramento series he, he played a ton. But um, do you know what his minutes per game last year were in the championship run i would guess like 15 to 18 minutes per game. okay was, that's, that's a good guess that's a good guess it was 20 minutes per game okay and, and i think some people who extol the wonderful virtues of kavan looney would would be a little surprised at how low that number is right because he starts a lot of the time and sometimes he just has these huge rebounding games uh we've talked about how solid he is but you end up with a lot of teams as they go deeper and deeper into the postseason, seemingly playing smaller, some of these big men getting played off the floor. And it goes back, let let me go back to Gobert. Some of the criticisms of him have even been less about, can you stretch him and take away his rim protection and attack him with pull-up shooting? And more about, on offense, what do you get? When the Clippers go small, he can't go inside and punish that mismatch like it's 1989 or something. So what do you get offensively on the other side of the court? And I think a lot of these big men who have been kind of fading out of lineups as you get at deeper and deeper into the playoffs with these really, really skilled, diverse, flexible teams, it's just as much uh, on the offensive side of the ball where the old traditional big, I mean, even... Even Brooke Lopez, although I think especially in this playoffs, he was able to take advantage of some mismatches down low. But like, imagine if Brooke Lopez didn't have a three-point shot. Um, it just becomes very, very limiting on offense, right? 
And I think w- when you bring up Kevon Looney, the other guy I think about is Demonis Sabonis and the way that they played him. Like, teams just beg them to take that mid-range shot. Like, they, they go into that delay action, the little delay action, Ben, where you have the big man you have the big man at the top of the key or the perimeter. They're holding the ball. Everyone is just kind of running around. They're playing the turnstile thing. And then when the defense is able to just drop off and be like, all right, you've got the ball. Make the shot. Do something about it. Both of them have a weakness in doing it. So I think that's where they played off. And I'm glad you said that about Gobert because it's the offense that hurts them more than the defensive part of it. Because if he was as good as he is defensively and was able to, like, you know, hit a guy with a drop step hook shot once in a while, I think that would make him so much more valuable. Whereas you watch Bam in game one against the Celtics, they were giving him a lot of space. Like Rob was like, hey, beat us with that 15 footer. And Bam was at least like, all right. I'll take the shot a few times, right? And now I would love for Bam to be able to generate easier shots for himself, but he's at least, like, solid enough on those tough shots, those 10 to 15 footers, where, you know, over the last couple of uh, uh, playoffs, he's shooting, like, 44% from mid-range. Not great, but it's enough that, like, you have to step up on him, especially for a big man. So it's almost like the further you get in the playoffs, it almost matters less about how good you are in a specific area And it matters more about, like, where your weak points and how bad and damaging are those weak points. And I think it becomes more valuable to have those players that I'm imagining one of those charts that's like a circle and you have, like, the spikes coming out where they're really good and it's, like, closer to the center. You want a guy that's, like, a smaller circle as opposed to, like, a spike and, like... Whoever's listening to the podcast is missing all of these hand motions. This is this is really some magical stuff. But I think that's what I'm thinking is it becomes more valuable to just be, like... uh, what what's the term it's like jack of all trades master of none type yeah. of thing yeah we we well you i think you're talking about specialization versus generalization yeah and and having flexibility have we've talked about brown belts versus one black belt i think what we learned from that segment is that you need a whiteboard right behind you so at any point if you need to diagram some basketball plays for the for the youtube watchers we we see you on youtube thanks for watching um we we need to get this going where cody can just turn around and start diagramming plays. Look, if, you, if you're still with us in this conversation, I think where this is building to me is this. And I, I, I should have started with this, probably lost half the audience, but this is, the, this is where, I'm, where I started today in my head when we, when we broached this topic. It seems like most of the great players in the league are huge big men, whether we want to call them four or five. Uh, not to take anything away from Steph Curry or any of the wings or whatever, but like size is huge. We've got some amazing uh, Giannis, Joel Embiid, Jokic, all these other guys. You look at the you look at the final four teams. Anthony Davis, right? We'll leave LeBron James aside, but he's huge. He he is a, a functionally a very important big in this series. But I'm, that's why I wanted to focus on the centers. Jokic versus AD, Bam Adebayo on the other side, and the Celtics kind of have two with Rob Williams and the Magic ageless Al Horford, uh, who's just like a wizard. Does he have a great name? I feel like he needs a great nickname. The Wizard of something. Should cool. Al Horford. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just saying, I'm not going to be able to come up with it on the spot. But I agree with you. Al needs something for sure. We've given the audience a lot of homework today. We need to name the three players in Miami, and Al Horford needs a nickname like that. But you have so, – so all these great players with the four teams left, they have – the four centers are huge. They're integral to what they do. They're great players. They're superstars, some of the best players in the league. And there are other players that have been eliminated, like like Giannis, that also fit this bill. And then at the same time, the strategic elements in every series are about how to exploit and attack that radial chart that you were talking about. Does anyone have a weakness I can poke at? And the downstream effect is that, of that it seems to be that if you are not really sturdy in all the key areas. Like you said, Bam can pass and he can actually get out and transition and and pass. So you get defense to offense stuff. And then uh, I don't love it, but at least at like 45, I think in the regular season, he's 47% on those mid rangers and short mid rangers. That's enough to keep you honest. It's enough that if you leave Jimmy Butler to double team him on a pick and roll, you can he can slip it back to Bam at ten feet and Bam can float it in from there, so you're balanced. Anthony Davis obviously balanced. Balanced. Jokic, the big question, as great as his offense has been, is can you balance out and not leak too much on defense? I think Denver's done a great job uh, this season and the last couple seasons building around uh, sort of his defensive strengths and weaknesses. 
all the way downstream, Cody, is like, we just don't see a lot of big men anymore who have gaps in the playoffs. They just go off the court, right? And that's where the Kevon Looney thing is interesting to me because he's not a shooter. Uh, he's not really a threat with the ball. Now he's improved his short roll passing. And just like some of these other guys, he's a pretty good defender around the basket. But you also have to be careful because if you can stretch him, you can create problems on the other end of the court. So so you end up with teams late in playoffs playing very diverse, sort of switchable, versatile defensive units. And it's like Julius Randle, Demonis Sabonis, maybe guys like that are the ultimate example where it's like you get to the playoffs and you take some stuff off the table. Whoa, what does that really mean for their value? Like what? What actually happens to that? Th- this is where my mind is going. There, the center is at the center of the game. See, this is the value conversation. This is where I want to go because the guy I've actually been thinking about. I've been thinking about Bam at a bio a lot in this case. So I'm going to tie him in with this guy, and people are like, "You're tying these guys together." Just hang with me for a second. I've been thinking about Rui Hachimura a lot because I just, you know, I watched some Wizards. I enjoyed watching the Wizards in the past, and I never thought, like, when I was watching him, I was never like, ah, that Rui, he's going to be a conference finals type of player. I just never thought that, and the thing with him is when he's out on the court, especially Ben, when he's surrounded by guys like LeBron and Davis that are doing a lot of the other offensive heavy lifting, he's pretty serviceable, right? If his job is like, hey, we just need you to, like, be physical and slow down Jokic a second so that Anthony Davis can hang back here, he does that just fine. So I guess, like, the question is, because especially you compare him to, to on the other side of the court, Jamal Murray, like, LeBron's just like, come here, young man. I'm going to come down there and just beat you down to the rim and, you know, hit a nice little drop step because LeBron's become a master of that. So is it that guys like Rui and Bam... Do they become more valuable in the playoffs or is it that everybody else becomes less valuable in the playoffs and it's those kind of guys that actually retain their value? That's the question that's going on with me right now. Hmm. Boy, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to mathematically juggle that one off the top of my head. Um, are I'll throw it back to you. Are you lower on guys like Gobert, Jared Allen, that kind of archetype? So that means... We can't shoot. And again, and again, I want to go back to your point earlier. When we start talking about archetypes, we lose the actual nuance of the player. Like no player is perfectly similar, right? Like not when you, you're talking about, well, they can switch and come out. Yes, but there's different degrees. Players have different skills. But just bear with me here. If I asked you about that Gobert, Jared Allen, guys that can't shoot and they don't necessarily do a lot of things with the ball offensively, so you're looking for rim running. Clint Capella would be another guy in this archetype, although he's a little older at this point in his career. And then you can defend and protect the basket, but you do have to be concerned about getting stretched out. Um, how, do, how do you feel about these players compared to a couple years ago? Uh, playoffs, okay. not regular season. Okay, playoffs. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, because guys like Gobert is – are so valuable in the regular seasons when it matters so much to actually make it to the playoffs, right? A great floor raiser in terms of just like you throw Gobert out there, you can run drop throughout the regular season, great. You have a solid baseline defense. But I really think this hurts because I've been, you know, on the forefront of of defending Rudy Gobert for years now, and I'm sure I've I've lost some relationships with just like (laughs) shouting that Rudy Gobert is, is this titanic defensive player, which I do think is still the case when he drops near the rim. But I do think that when you have these bigger glaring weaknesses, I'm probably lower on you. And I don't know how much I've changed on Gobert's defense, but I think the glaring weakness of, like, he could be taken advantage of in offenses. We talked about how in Game 7, I've referred back to it a couple times now, but the Celtics-Sixers game, the Harden and Embiid did exactly what the Celtics wanted. And if you have somebody like Gobert out there, all of a sudden the playoff team could be like, hey, we want the offense to end up with Gobert having the ball down here. And then you have a clear place that, like, the defense is going to want to dictate. And if you have something like that on the court... I just think that makes it really difficult to be like, all right, when we're scheming, we also have to make sure that this doesn't happen. We have to protect this person from here. So I don't know. I'm probably a little bit lower than I was in the past. Yeah, and and the flip side is clearly, as we're seeing in this series with the Lakers, there are teams that can try to create infrastructure to keep the Rob Williamses and Anthony Davises of the world closer to the basket, right? 
But the league seems to be reacting by saying, well, we want to put more skill and more shooting out there. So you lose more and more value when you make that trade off. And even in this series with the Nuggets, it's like, you asked me earlier, what's the what's the one, you know, what are some of the things Denver can do with this adjustment uh, with Aaron Gordon? And I said, the simplest one and probably the lowest value one is just instead of having him in the dunker spot on the baseline near the basket, like just that little area that they hang out at the edge of the paint behind the backboard, just stick him in the corner. And that means you can kick it out to him and he can shoot threes. Now, the thing there, as everyone knows, is Aaron Gordon's not a great shooter, but he will make threes. So you're in a situation where compared to like seven years ago, that player might not have been able to make threes. So you could leave him the Andre Roberson effect, as we've talked about here with just ignoring guys like that. Now that player makes threes, but maybe it's like 32%. And I just feel like we keep pushing into a world where it's like, well, actually, it's going to be 34%. Maybe one day it's going to be 35%. And each percentage point there, you lose a little value, I would think, defensively, because you have to give that up. You have to sacrifice that if you try to keep guys close to the basket. And um, that, to me, is a really forward-facing, interesting conversation about just getting more skill on the floor is kind of like what I talked about with Mike D'Antoni last year, just like more point guards, more shooters, more passers, more decision makers. And maybe the Nuggets have that cheat code in a sense where because their center is that guy, because their center can shoot, play point guard. And by the way, when we say shoot, we mean like really sh- The guy's like Dirk Nowitzki crossed with Zach Randolph with, with Larry Bird sprinkled in. Uh, it's like he can really shoot. He can really move without the ball, and he's the best passer, playmaker, decision maker with the ball. That's your five position. So you can put four skilled players around him more easily in terms of pulling from the personnel, pulling from the talent pool that's available in the league. The more the league goes in that direction, uh, does it become harder and harder for big men to stay near the basket? I I think it does. And I... You said something in there that's really interesting because you said that you want to have more point guards and shooting guards on the I'm court. I'm glad because I, I didn't know if there was anything good in that. So I'm glad <laughs> okay. to hear that there was one thing you could take. Listen, Ben, everything that you say is just like I'm just I'm just plucking, plucking off the buffet table. Like each one of them could be a meal in itself. But you say more point guards and shooting guards. But I, I, I don't think you necessarily mean the tra- in the traditional sense. Like when you say point guards and shooting guards, you're saying Correct. Jokic is a point guard. You're yep, saying that exactly. LeBron is a point guard. And I think... That's the interesting thing, and the one, the other thing that I've been thinking about in these playoffs is, um, and yeah, this could be a short thing because there's a very short history of these guys, but there's not any of the like hyper athletic, explosive offensive first point guards that are like six two, six three, six four in the playoffs right now. Like all of these offenses right now are run by guys who are, what is is Jason Tatum, Jimmy Butler, the smallest like play creator, the it, play initiator. That's in the playoffs right now because you have Jimmy Butler, Jason Tatum, LeBron James, Nikola Jokic. Like, you mean you mean for for the elite, the the primary driver? Yeah, on the team. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah, all and, and they're all big. Them, yeah, none of them are like this explosive paint touching point guard. And I always thought that it was like really valuable to have the one point guard that's like, hey, you need a little jitterbug point guard that can stay in front of this guy because if you don't, he's just gonna blow by every time and get into the paint. But we're in a conference finals right now where none of the teams, literally no one, like the closest thing to that is, is what? Malcolm Brogdon? Austin Reeves? Like who, who's the best? Dennis Schroeder? Like who's the best example of the the quick little guy that's getting into the paint? None of them are superstar level players. I find that interesting. Mur- is, does Murray count? <sighs> is he that quick? <laughs> is he that much quicker than I the guys? He's the said? blue arrow. I don't know. I don't know. I, um, I feel like Malcolm Brogdon's a better example. It might, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. It, okay. This also has me thinking. I, I gotta before we get out of here and wrap up. I I, I gotta. This guy's been on my mind. DeAndre Ayton. Mm. This like okay. He's the number one pick. Let's leave aside the silliness of that decision. Just the concept of like if he can be a good big defender. And there were a lot of criticisms of him in Arizona in terms of his awareness. But physically, can we develop him into a guy that protects the rim pretty well? Yes. Does he have skill? around the basket and post touches. Yes. Can he shoot the jump shot? Yes. Uh, mid-range shot is like, it's nasty. It's really dialed in. So I don't know if my scouting report 
has changed on De- DeAndre Ayton in the last three years since the Suns went to the finals in 2021. He played pretty well in that playoff run. Um, I mean, we're talking about a guy who shoots uh, 48% from the mid-range this season. I don't, I don't know if it's changed, and yet all of the sort of like uh, uh, talking head Monday morning quarterback criticisms aside of like Aiden didn't look engaged on this play and the, all that aside, like his actual game, just the package in my head keeps going down every like six months, you know, like every playoff cycle. I'm like, boy, yeah, you could throw it into DeAndre Orton, uh, DeAndre Aiden, and, and he could, I don't know who DeAndre Orton is. <laughs> he played for Kentucky. Um, only Kentucky people will get that, that joke. Um, you know, you could like throw it into him and he could hook somebody to death. He could take advantage of mismatches. You could play pick and pop. He can get you 23 a game with 10 boards and two blocks. If you set up your defense, he's like a solid big man defender, but he's not great. And that, that like description in my head keeps, I'm not even, I'm like, I don't know. Is that like a top 60 or 70 player anymore? It just keeps kind of getting lower. I think because of everything we're talking about within the context of how the game is played within the context of having a baseline of like a 114 offensive rating in the playoffs. DeAndre Ayton, I I feel like he's actually an interesting comparison with Bam Adebayo right now because both of them have this thing where they like to take the mid-range jumper. You say that Ayton shot what like 47-48% from mid-range in these playoffs. He took about 8 mid-range shots a game. So you look at that and you're like, "Oh, that's a good percentage." but you look at his actual relative true shooting percentage, he's shooting worse than league average in the playoffs. Bam Adebayo, shooting about 44% mid-range, also shooting worse than league average, right? And so you have these guys that, again, neither of them generate really good, efficient offense for themselves. And I think that hurts DeAndre Ayton a lot more because like we talked about with Bam, Bam was Ayton doesn't necessarily have glaring weaknesses on defense. Bam is just so much better at all of those on defense, right? He can lock someone down in isolation. He can rim protect. He can run any defensive scheme. He can also, on offense, pass so much better from Ay- than Aiton. Aiton's not necessarily a guy. I think he's a pretty poor passer comparatively to a lot of these hubs, so he's not adding value there. So you have this guy that's not generating easy offense for himself. He's not generating easy looks for his teammates. He's not locking anyone down on defense, yet he's playing a position where you want that anchor to be a lot more solid on defense. So I think he's an example of like the jack of all trades kind of guy, but it's like he almost has too big of a role for what he's used for. Like he's just not good enough at some of those things for the big of, for the role that I think people want him to play. The flip side is there was a guy uh, drafted after him in that draft, Jaron Jackson, Jaron Jackson Jr. Oh, I thought you were talking about the other one. You didn't know what direction I was going to go in there. And and he seems to be someone who fits very well with the direction of today's game, attacks closeouts, takes advantage of mismatches, shoots threes, although you want that percentage to be higher. Uh, and and I th- again, I think it goes both ways. If, if you're versatile and switchable on the perimeter, this is the direction that leads you toward dominance. It's almost like there's there's a divergence in my mind with these big players. And again, we can just call them centers, but 6'9", 6'10", the, the big men that used to sort of patrol the paint and be so critical in basketball. And height has always reigned supreme in basketball. It still does. Height is so key. You just mentioned it. There just aren't really short primary stars left in, in this year's playoffs. So uh, Jamal Jamal Murray is Jamal, Jamal Murray is six four. He's he's like a he's like a pretty big quote unquote small guard anyway. But I think what's happened today is you have like if you're Jaron Jackson Jr., if you're Jokic, if you're someone that has the offensive skills, be it shooting or a combination of shooting and ball skills, so you can fit into different actions. You know, you talked about Sabonis. Think about how different it is if Sabonis has a money mid-range jumper. Think about what that takes away defensively. Similar to a play in the Jokic video from this week on game one against Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis leans a little too hard to try to take away a passing angle because he's got a seven and a half foot wingspan. He's extraordinary at making passes harder. You would intuitively think, I want to make this entry pass harder in this elbow offense. Jokic is running elbow offense. Sabonis is running elbow offense. And Davis leans a little too much. 
and he has to stick out there on Jokic because he doesn't want to give him space to shoot, and that opens up the driving lane. With Sabonis, we saw the opposite. It's like, yeah, you can crowd him if you want to pass, but just play off him a little bit and either completely give him the jumper or sag all the way back into the lane because when he has the ball, you can't have defensive three seconds. Not sure they should have defensive three seconds anyway at this point, but you can't have defensive three seconds. So uh, maybe, maybe that's the direction of this conversation. We have this whole conversation, and then they just get rid of defensive three seconds, and you just try to figure out how to guard four on five on the perimeter and leave your, leave your big man in the paint. Um, but I was saying the divergence, right? It's like the more skills you bleed off in that direction, and nothing against the uh, Jared Allens, Gobert's, uh, you know, Mitchell Robinsons of the world, but it's like it just gets harder and harder, it seems, for those guys to even play in the playoffs and play in the later rounds, let alone have this value. But if you do have these skills when you're big, then you have the potential to become a superstar or a star and the strategic centerpiece of like the entire, like we're, we're at the end of the playoffs here. Like one of these teams is going to win a championship. There's only four left. It's been happening every round. How do I move these key pieces around to create an advantage for my big man, my center, my centerpiece in most cases of the team? And I'm going to kind of put together a group of players that I find really interesting in terms of what we were just talking about here. Ben, uh, Jaron Jackson, Evan Mobley, DeAndre, Bam Adebayo, DeMontis Sabonis. All of these guys... All of these guys were under league average efficiency in these playoffs. So there is this aspect of like, it's so tough to like, you have these two groups, like you just said, you could throw Nick Claxton in there too, Mitchell Robinson, these like lob threat rim protectors that are going to be efficient. But beyond that, they're not really bringing much else offensively to the table. You're not going to throw it into them and tell them to to go to work. I think Jared Allen's probably the best of that group to be able to do that sort of thing. But Capella, are, you, you can include Capella, you can include... Yeah. Hartenstein. I mean, it's 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 a good amount of big men here, I think. Exactly. So you have this bucket of big men that can get solid efficiency from scoring, but they're doing it because they're so dependent. But then you have this other bucket of those those aforementioned guys I was just talking about, where they're just like they're not quite good enough generating on their own to get efficient offense. And I think trying to marry those two together, trying to get yourself from being a guy that can generate some offense, but it's not quite super efficient versus being a super dependent and getting a few more skills that that allows you to, to have a little bit of offensive primacy. I think that's really the interesting thing is taking these two and trying to meld it into a, a complete let, no weakness offensive big man. San Antonio Spurs, how you doing? The whole point of this podcast was to get us right here talking about the center, forward facing. There's a guy from France coming over, and I just think it's a it's a it's a conversation for another day, but at least we can seed that conversation with what we've talked about today here because we're at this point in the playoffs, all these things are happening strategically with these big men and Wembenyama, um I, I mean, can he can he shoot? We know he can shoot. How good of a shooter can he be? So you check that box. Does he have ball skills? Yes, it looks like he potentially has ball skills. So he checks that box. Can he combine these things and pass and play in different systems? Potentially, yes, he checks that box. Is he a defensive monster who also fits the Anthony Davis, Jaron Jackson, bam, I'm, I'm a little more versatile. I'm a little more switchable. He also potentially checks that box. So... Whatever happens with his career, knock on wood, we know he's going to San Antonio now. It's really interesting to think about all these changes and then the intersection of that with not just Wemby as an athlete, right? Like being a 7'3 dude from France who comes along and moves like this and plays basketball really well, but the decisions that he's made in his game to try to develop a three-point shot, to take this running one footed three. I don't know if he's ever going to use that in the NBA uh, to try to dribble like a point guard would back in the old days, because you, you want and need these skills to fit into these on offensive concepts. And they dictate heavily how you're defended as you go to the later rounds in the playoffs. And so you come back full circle and we can, we can finish here. You run into a Eric Spolstra in the postseason. You run into a mad scientist like that. Um, you're not going to expose yourself on your little radial chart that you had to one of those huge weaknesses that can be attacked, either playing you off the court 
in some cases, if you're a lesser overall player or just diminishing your value, if you have like this great big value add that you bring to the court, say Rudy Gobert protecting the basket, how can I remove Rudy Gobert from the basket so that dents his value? Because Cody, we are in an era where instead of us having to do like 10 or 15 minutes on today's podcast about the structural changes that the Lakers made in game one, moving Rui Hachimura, that's all anybody's talking about because it just, it's something that you don't get to game five and you're like, oh my God, they made this incredible adjustment. They they put Andrew Bogut on Tony Allen. They they might've figured something out. Tony Allen can't shoot. It's like, no, you got to the third quarter. We got to the third quarter and the Lakers were like, oh, let's do that. Let's do that thing that uh, Philly tried against Denver in, in January. Let's, let's cook that one up. Uh, Rui, you're really strong. You go on Jokic. AD, you know, you know what to do, baby. You you know the drill. You got a you got a mediocre shooter. Patrol the paint. Get ready in help position and blow that baby up. To be fair, it took the Celtics a few games to get back to their their double big lineup against the 76ers. But here here's my commentary on Wemby. Here's my commentary. But scouting before the NBA is so outside my purview, right? Just so outside my purview. But I'm going to full circle this one here because I've been hearing a lot of talks about like, this is how good he's going to be. He's going to be the best rookie. He's going to be so much better than this player. Just remember, he can shoot. He can dribble. He can defend the rim. He's switchable and he is athletic. But ask yourself, like, what do we mean he can do these things? And when we get into a playoff series, which one of these things is going to be the biggest weakness? How much of it is it actually going to be a weakness? And is he going to be able to cover it up? Because until I start seeing it, like, I don't necessarily know that stuff, right? We know he's going to be very good. But as we talked about when we detailed some of the best young seasons ever, it's really hard to be as good as we're saying when you're that young. Like, it just doesn't happen. Patreon.com slash Thinking Basketball. That is where you can find the stats board that we use all the time during this show and and researching topics and videos. Patreon.com slash Thinking Basketball. That's also the best way to directly support this show and everything we do. Hope you enjoyed this. uh, We we got a little philosophical today, Cody. We we stepped back and and we we circled the wagons a little bit. Hope you enjoyed this one. And uh, we will be, yeah, I I think we'll have some, hopefully some exciting strategic analysis when we come back after the weekend. Uh, We have game two of the Lakers and the Nuggets tonight. And that means we will be done with game threes when we talk to everybody again on Monday. So look forward to that. And uh, of course, I hope you're having a great day.